Hello again, and welcome to Indoor Environments. Uh, I'm your co-host, Bob Krell. I'm the publisher and founder of Healthy Indoors Magazine. And as always, I'm joined uh, by co-host Don Weeks, who is still the president of IQGA, right? The Indoor Environmental Quality Global Alliance, right? That's right. That hasn't changed. Okay. I'm in my <laughs> third I, year now. It's been a while. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> so this, so anyway, yeah. welcome everyone to season two. This is our seventh episode, but we are, have been renewed. So we have another year. Uh, you'll have to put up with our two pumpkin heads here. Um, so anyway, uh, welcome, welcome board. If you're watching us and joining us live today, um, we're live streaming on the Healthy Indoors online global community. And there is a uh, chat box there. So you're welcome to uh, enter any questions you have for our guest and we'll moderate those and, uh, uh, ask you know pass those questions along so by all means i join in in the chat after after the show will be available uh indefinitely on the same link uh where you found us and you'll be able to comment in the comments which uh stay there indefinitely so anyway so don what's happening in canada uh well it's getting uh warmer but not uh not quite summer yet uh, we're still uh we're still uh, looking at heavy rain today, so we'll, we'll manage to get through in a, a, a sunny day, to maybe in a day or two. We'll see. And we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Nicola Carsall uh, be our guest today. She is a professor of indoor air chemistry at the University of York in the United Kingdom. And she previously at the University of York, she was a lecturer and a senior lecturer in environmental science. She also was a research associate at the School of Environmental Science in East Anglia. He holds a PhD degree from the University of East Anglia. And Dr. Carsar's uh, uh, work primarily involves numerical modeling of air pollution chemistry in the indoor environment. She's a member of a number of committees and expert groups, all which we'll discuss uh, during the, um, uh, the hour. And she's also an associate editor for Indoor Air for the publication Atmospheric Environment. Today's subject or topic is Indoor air chemistry, should we be worried? And today's webcast is sponsored by the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, ISIAC. Welcome. And, uh, this, this production is, a, is a, a joint production of ISIAC and the Indoor Environmental Quality Global Alliance. Had to throw that in there. So without further ado, welcome. Hello. Oh, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Good, good, good. So I'm going to start with uh, with your education. Uh, I noted as in the introduction that you were uh, involved also in the University of East Anglia and the University of Leeds, focusing on chemistry and environmental science. And at the University of York, you have changed a bit towards environmental science and air pollution, and recently indoor air chemistry. So how did you become uh, in, interested in indoor air chemistry? That's that's a good question um, and quite a long story, I guess. So. Um, Going back to when I was at school, I was always interested in chemistry. Um, but I think it's fair to say that some aspects of chemistry I found more interesting than others. So what I really enjoyed was physical chemistry, understanding how the world, world worked, I guess, and the chemistry behind that. So when I was looking around for a university degree, I wanted to do something that was predominantly predominantly chemistry, but not just chemistry. So I decided it would be really good to do environmental chemistry. And I would say that ever since then, I've I've always worked in chemistry departments or environment departments, but I'm very much at the interface, I guess. So it's chemistry, but applied to the environment. So when I was at university, I did a module as part of my degree on atmospheric chemistry. And that's what really got me interested in um, air pollution in general, I guess. So thinking about air quality outdoors, issues like climate change. Um, and then I did a PhD in atmospheric chemistry. So again, that was focusing on outdoor air chemistry. Um, and my early postdoctoral work was also very much around outdoor air quality and um Going from my PhD, where I made measurements, my postdoctoral work started to get me into modelling, which is where I developed my interest in modelling. I still do that now. Um, and then not long after moving to York, I got involved in a small project looking at air quality in cars. And that was what really started to get me more interested in the indoor environment. So this was around probably 2003, 2004. And there were... I felt like there were lots of people working on outdoor air quality and not so many people working on indoor air quality, at least not in the UK. So I just started to delve into indoor air quality, indoor air chemistry, found it really, 
fascinating, I guess. And and so that's what I focus on now entirely, actually. Great. Um, so uh, why don't you explain a little bit about what you meant when you said you did a, a uh, some some work on in, the environments in cars? That's, that's of interest, of course. So what 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 were we measuring? What were we looking for? Yeah. So. I wasn't measuring. This was the first time I'd applied a model to indoor air, actually. Um, I so I had colleagues who were measuring. And I think what I mean, this is a long time ago now, probably 20 years ago. But I think the um, the reason for that study was all to do with new car smell. So hmm. this, this is a thing, maybe not so much anymore. But I know certainly a few years ago, people used to uh, well, I suppose there's a split a split feeling about this. Some people really like the smell of new cars, the, the smell of the leather and, and other things going on, um, other emissions coming from the new materials. Um, and other people didn't like the smell. Um, and I guess what we were doing was trying to understand what caused that smell um, and, you know, what, what was going on. So there were some very basic measurements being made and we were... Mm just trying to do some very basic modeling but it's very different to what i do now i guess over time it's become a lot more complex and involved well, it's definitely right. preferable to old car smell um <laughs> but if you think about it though we, we do spend a lot of time in automobiles right in in, in vehicles mm. uh many hours right Our, some people spend many hours per day in vehicles and uh so the, the emissions i guess are, that's your secondary environment right you have probably or third you have your home your your workplace and then if you're commuting yeah, so actually, um, Rich Corsi, who is now, I think he's moved to San Francisco now, but he came up with with something that a lot of indoor air chemists refer to as the Corsi code, mm -hmm. which was taking your um, average lifetime of your, you know, your typical um, adult in a developed country, which I believe is about 79 years, um, and then he broke it down into where you spent your time in those different micro environments. So 70 years are spent indoors out of your 79, 50 years are spent in your home out of your 79, 25 are spent in your bedroom. Um, unless you're a teenager, in which case you might switch those last two around for my children <laughs> and to go by. And then you get down to um, five years, which is the average number of years that you would spend outdoors in your lifetime. And then I think commuting was four years, if I remember correctly. So it's almost equivalent. And, you know, these are averages, obviously, but there's an almost equivalent time that the average person will spend commuting to outdoors. Um, but obviously, compared to the time we spent indoors in the home, for instance, so both very small proportions. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with Rich Corsi. Uh, he and I worked on uh, Indoor Air 2002. Um, which was uh, down in Austin, Texas, and he's moved to the University of California in Davis now. So that's that's where yeah. he's located. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting, interesting the work he's doing. So um, one of your early papers uh, publications in 2012 was entitled "A Significant Role of Nitrate and Peroxide Groups of, on Indoor Secondary or Organic Aerosols." Can you kind of tell us what the findings of that paper were and how it relates to indoor in, uh, air chemistry going forward? Yeah, so, so what we were looking at there um, was trying to understand, so that I guess we've, we've taken a few steps along now from my early trying to, you know, use models to look at the air quality in cars. So over the intervening period, I tried to develop um, basically models that I'd started off using for outdoor air quality investigations and start to um, use similar techniques, but specialized for for how you'd start to consider indoor environments um and one thing that we we're interested in in that bit of work was to look at how we form particles indoors through activities like cooking and cleaning um and then thinking about what is the composition of those particles once they're formed so we know an awful lot about outdoor particles and we we worry about outdoor particles so for instance um, particle emissions from from motor vehicles is is quite a, a you know dominates worry about uh, things like health concerns from health, air pollution. So um, we know quite a lot about the composition of particles outdoors, and people have looked at health effects of those. Um, and we know, for instance, that very small particles are of concern because they can get much further down into your respiratory system and cause health effects. What we know much less about is 
what is the composition of particles formed from indoor activities? So what happens when we cook? We know that we make very high concentrations of particles, but we don't really know much about the composition. And with the 2012 paper, we were trying to look at the composition of particles that were formed from cleaning processes. Um, there has been a bit more experimental work done now, actually, uh, lots of work going on in the US, um, some uh, lots of really exciting studies funded by the Sloan Foundation looking at this. Um, but we didn't really know much back when we did this paper. So what we found was that when, when we had um, typical background conditions in the house, we weren't doing cleaning, we had particles that were dominated by organic nitrate materials. So things like, I mean, I don't want to get too technical, but um, so carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens in molecules, and they're quite big some of them. Um, and then we found that when we did uh, cleaning, so we ran the model for um, a simulated cleaning activity, and we found that the composition of the particles changed and was much more um, dominated by chemicals called peroxides. So what was quite interesting, I think, was it showed that the composition of the particles indoors could be very different depending on the activities that were going on. But what we don't know uh, even now, and this is still still a very similar problem for outdoors, actually, is how the composition of particles or how differences in composition affect health. Um, so that's still something where we need to join up better, I think, with the health specialists looking at the toxic, you know, toxicological effects of these particles from different sources. But that's pretty complex, right? Because it, it's such a dynamic environment. I mean, an indoor environment. It just just a slight uh, alteration of, you know, any activity, right, is going to potentially dramatically uh, change the chemical composition of what's there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And things like cooking can have, you know, dramatic effects, particularly with particle concentrations where you could maybe have several hundred micrograms per meter cubed. So to give you the context for that, if you were outdoors on a busy road in London, you maybe would have 10, 15 micrograms per meter cube. So these concentrations are, you know, really large. Um, but what we don't know is how do they impact human health compared to the particles produced by diesel engines, for instance. You mentioned uh, some of the work that's been done since this paper by this, you know, papers done for the Sloan Foundation. Yeah. And you have, um, have this been that connection that you're talking about to health effects at this point, or is this still under study? Um, no, so the Sloan projects don't focus on health um, okay. specifically. The Sloan um, programs is, is called Chemistry of Indoor Environments, and it focuses very much on the fundamental chemistry, which is great, I think, because it's meant that scientists can actually study the, the processes and try and understand what's going on in a chemical sense. Um, and it's unlike any other program going on in the world. So quite often when you you, you write your grant proposals. It it will quite often be linked to health. And, and that's the reason that we always study these things because there are impacts for human health. But it was nice to have a program that was so focused on understanding the fundamentals and really trying to get to the, you know, the nitty gritty of the chemistry. Mm -hmm. Great, terrific. Um, so can you tell us about one of your more recent publications in 2022, modification of cleaning product formula formulations could improve indoor air quality? What are the, some of the findings of that paper? Okay, so what, what we were doing there was, um, we, so if, if you pick up any cleaning compound and look at the label, you will see tens and sometimes actually mm. hundreds of products. Um, so you can have a whole list of um, products that are doing things like degreasing, perhaps, or providing fragrance in some instances. Um, and what we were interested in in this paper was thinking about, well, can we mess about with the formulation of the cleaning product and how does that affect the chemistry? And the reason we wanted to do that is we know that through the chemistry that happens when you clean, um, you can form a whole range of secondary pollutants and some of those are harmful to health. So the things that we look at at York in particular are things like formation of formaldehyde and also particulate matter. So we said that particulate matter can be harmful to health, but we also know formaldehyde at high enough concentrations can be a carcinogen. So we know that both of these things are made through the 
industry. So the, the thought behind the paper was, what about if we can change the product formulation so that we make less formaldehyde and we make less particulate matter? So we basically looked at three, just to make it simple. So again, this is a modeling study. We looked at three compounds that are um, used commonly in cleaning um, formulations. And we just messed about with the ratio of those three uh, terpenes, the terpene species. So these are the things that make stuff smell of things like pine forests and lemons. So they're naturally occurring products that are in lots of things we use around the home. So we, we just altered the proportions of them. And then we, we found that we could make very different concentrations of the secondary pollutants like formaldehyde and particulate matter, which means in theory, you could use this sort of information to alter your cleaning product formulations to make less harmful products when you clean. Um, so, I mean, it's a kind of proof of concept um, study, I guess, because what we'd really need is to work with people from fragrance industry, cleaning product industries, to work out if the sorts of um, formulations we're suggesting actually smell nice it might smell very unpleasant so you, you need to have the two sets of people working together really and did you look at, so the, these are household cleaning products did you look at like personal cleaning products like body washes shampoos that sort of thing or was that not part of the study um not in that study but we have looked at those sorts of things in other studies so um it, it's really it's really hard to talk about a typical shampoo or a typical body wash as well because they are so different um so we were looking at one study where we looked at a range of shampoos, shower gels, uh, moisturizers, a couple of other products. But, you know, looking at maybe 20 to 25 of these things. And we were looking at um, just what was in. If you, if you imagine if you take a lid off a bottle of shower gel, mm -hmm. you can just look at what's in the gas, um, the sort of headspace above the liquid, if you like. So what's in that mm -hmm that gas area the um you know just the air above the the liquid um and so that's it's quite the volatile that's the stuff that's volatizing yeah, right off, exactly. off the actual yeah. product in that small air gap okay. yeah that's it um and there's an enormous variation between these different products which means that you could have very different impacts when you use them and interestingly enough we've been doing a, a project at york over the last uh, year and a half or so where we've been looking at products that are labeled as green or natural mm. which is quite interesting because these products are often contain exactly the same chemicals as your traditional shower gels cleaners what have you you know so if you get the smell of lemon it doesn't matter if it comes from a lemon or if it's made synthetically it's the same chemical and you'll have the same reactions so we found for a lot of the cleaners we've been looking at that are labeled as green or natural, they actually have higher concentrations of some of these uh, volatile fragrance compounds really? than, than your standard supermarket home makes. So, so, yeah. so the only thing that really makes them green is the word green on the bottle, basically. That's, yeah. yeah, or the, the source yeah. of them. But yeah, perhaps, the marketing. You know. well, it, what, the reason I and I raised that question because I was just overnight in Washington D.C. Sunday night, and I ended up using a hotel uh, shower gel. That mm -hmm. so my wife has totally gotten us very non chemically oriented in our home. So it's you know cleaning with white vinegar and you know some essential oils mixed in with that, and uh, you know and not using any like heavy personal you know products and using that shower gel i thought i just doused myself in, in like a, a chemical pool after i got done with that came out i was like oh, it's awful yeah well i have something similar with some of the uh students that come to see me in my office so i i don't don't wear fragrances at all and i i really notice it if someone comes to my office with very strong aftershave or perfume that it it just seems to hang around for ages afterwards. and the longer you stay away from it i think the work you know like as you start to adapt a lifestyle where you try to limit you know the exposure to that stuff then exposure is like on an aircraft you know you're sitting right next to somebody just oh it's awful yeah, anyway absolutely i digress <laughs> so nick i was wondering you had you have mentioned a couple of times um uh, that you're specifically involved in modeling do you work as a team with other people who do the measurements and, and how does that, how does that type of project work? Where, where do you, who gets the idea and how does it flow to the end product? Oh, that's, that's a good question. So I, I, I do work in a team. I have, I have a fantastic research group. So I've got a couple of postdocs and three PhD students working with me at the moment. And we're all um, 
basically involved with modeling, but we do work very closely with experimentalists. Um, so we've got a number of projects going on at, at York at the moment. Um, so for instance, one of the projects I'm involved with at the moment, we're looking at cooking and cleaning emissions. Mm -hmm. And so I've got colleagues in chemistry um, at York who are making measurements and then we're dealing with the modeling side. So I would I would say I, th I think the best the best work is when modelers and experimentalists work together, actually, because you, you gain so much by by working together. So the experimental data is really, really important, obviously. Um, it tells you what's happening in a room at any one time, I suppose. But it doesn't always tell you about the things that you can't measure. It doesn't always allow you to you know, you, there's only a limited number of buildings you can measure in. Um, it doesn't tell you about what might happen in the future. So I think when you get the modelers working together with the experimentalists, you just get that extra layer of insight that you wouldn't have otherwise. And the other thing I think is working it the other way around, that we can use the models to say, well, actually, it'd be really good if we had some measurements of these compounds um, and actually help to guide the experimentalists with what sort of things they might go and go out and measure in the future to, to, to help with the models as well. So. I think, you know, that symbiotic relationship can be really powerful, actually. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's certainly that's what I think a lot of uh, people miss is that they're, they're, they're kind of in their own little uh, citadel, as it were, and they, they, they do things there, but they don't necessarily interact with the other folks that are doing things that are uh, different than they are, but it can can be, certainly be of, of use. So that's, yeah. that's, that's interesting. So how, how big a group do you have at the uh, University of York uh, working on things um, like that? So in my my research group, there's uh, six of us at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but there's also probably, uh, well, working in indoor, maybe at least that many people in chemistry as well, if not mm -hmm. more. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So it, I'd say it's the most focused center for indoor air quality in the UK, for sure. Well, great. That's it, it, that's important to be able to have that kind of uh, interaction, and I, yeah. I know that you, you're working on a number of other types of uh, committees as well. And one of them that uh, we wanted to talk about a little bit is is the um, the uh, UK Department of Health's community uh, committee on the medical effects of air pollution. And I was wondering, and I understand this is called the COMIC, COMIC, or yep, COMIC, yeah, COMIC. And what have, what have they done so far? What has been their most important uh, accomplishment uh, to date? Um, so what, what the committee do is they look at um, health data effectively. So what, what they're trying to do is provide a risk assessment to government, I guess, about you know the risks of exposure to different air pollutants. So it's an incredibly difficult job I would say so I'm I'm quite lucky I sit on the committee as an atmospheric scientist um, not as a health specialist which I'm quite pleased about because I think the health people on the committee have a much harder job than I do um, and what they try and do is review all the information that's out there on you know big studies that are looking at um, air pollution concentration changes over time and then trying to look for signals in health data that go with that so so what you should be able to say is that if the concentration of PM, for example, PM 2.5 increases by one microgram per meter cubed, how many extra deaths might we expect in a population? How many extra um, other, you know, uh, non-fatal health effects might we uh, expect? So being able to do that means that government can then make decisions on policy you know what what's the key pollutants that they need to worry about um what should be the restrictions on traffic in a city those sort of questions so it, it's about trying to review all the health evidence and give advice to government um and it's tricky because you're often looking for small signals i guess or um you know you you, you need thousands and thousands of people to look across to see to see what impact there is on changing pollutant concentrations. It's really tricky, I think. And also because so many pollutants tend to be emitted together, that it's sometimes really difficult to work out, well, actually, is that health in effect coming from nitrogen dioxide or particulate matter? Because they both come out of the back of cars, for instance. But I mean, that data is, you know, I find kind of remarkable, the data that we've seen, you know, thus far, and, and quite alarming, 
I mean, as far as as far as the outcomes, you know, it, you know how the mortality rate based on these airborne particulates that we're exposed to in, in, in ver various uh, locations around the world. I mean, some some places around the globe are awful. I mean, yeah. well, actually, I, I think it's bad everywhere. But I mean, there's there, some substantially worse than others. I mean, noticed during the pandemic when travel, especially in the United States, decreased. But even in, when production in India and other places it seemed like the PM levels, you know, the PM 2.5 levels dropped you know quite substantially during during those times where we had lesser activity as a you know a human race but this is really interesting because that very same um observation had very different impacts for indoors so what happened outdoors was that people stopped driving their cars or at least in the uk i'm not sure about the us but in the uk we definitely did that yeah. so we noticed that outdoor concentrations of pm and no2 went down quite significantly outdoors but because of the chemistry, again, what that meant was that ozone concentrations outdoors went up. And that's important for indoors because we know that the main source of indoor ozone is from outdoors through windows and open doors, basically. Mm -hmm. And infiltration. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So if outdoor air, if outdoor ozone increases, indoor ozone increases. And that's important because we know that indoor ozone drives a lot of the chemical reactions. So even though outdoors was better indoors actually potentially was worse um because we some modeling we did around that found that formaldehyde concentrations probably went up by 20 percent and also I, again i don't know what happened in the us but in the uk everybody became a home baker so everybody mm -hmm. was yeah. baking more and cooking more everybody was well, that and a hoarder too i mean i think, yeah. I think we did a lot we did a lot of hoarding at the early stages we didn't know if we were at the apocalypse yet yeah that's um, right <laughs> it was toilet roll here so you know, uh, yeah, well, here too. Right? Yeah. yeah, not so much in Canada. They're, they're prepared. <laughs> well, we did a lot of baking. I can tell you that in in our household. And and you're right. The uh, particulate level certainly can can increase uh, dramatically when you when you're doing a lot more cooking at home. Um, mm. That we you know we didn't go out to restaurants for I think for almost almost a year at least. Yeah. Uh, if a lot of them were not open at all so we had some takeout but yeah i did a lot more home cooking and, and that that brings up you know are we looking at specific um are you looking in your studies like specific issues in in terms of uh indoor air quality and indoor air chemistry that we can share with the audience now this is something in particular that that stood out in the studies that you've seen or the studies you've conducted yourself um well that's that's a good question um I mean, I, I think one thing that's come out from a lot of the recent studies and particularly from the um, Sloan funded work going on in the US is just the importance of people indoors. So mm. we know, you know, we've been talking about cooking and cleaning and that's in some ways that's pretty obvious because we we do things um, that cause high concentration. So it's it's particularly obvious when you cook. I think you can smell things happening. You know, there's chemistry going on. But I think the other thing that's come out is just the importance of just people being in space. So we know, for instance, that we breathe um, various volatiles. So every, everybody knows we breathe out carbon dioxide, but we also breathe out different hydrocarbons like isoprene and acetone. So those things that we breathe out can contribute to indoor air quality. But even our skin, so there's some really interesting studies now that have been looking at the impact of ozone, which we've we've just said that can come indoors, it can react with your skin oil. So we know that in your skin, you have lots of um, fatty acids and things that like to react with ozone. And when that happens, you get other compounds that are given off um, carbonyl species are, are giving off in, in, into that space. So j even just by sitting in your armchair reading a book, you're still impacting on the indoor air quality so and I, I think that's really interesting that you can even just have this passive effect yeah no that is interesting i mean basically many people probably wouldn't even think of that they say well i'm doing my my bit i'm, I'm staying home and uh, they, they, i shouldn't have any issues but, uh, of course homes are, are one of those environments that we don't have as much test data as what we'd like to have because it's very difficult to have people open up their homes and then, you know, unfortunately yeah. get not necessarily great results. So what you mentioned that there's potential for health risk with some of these uh, compounds. Is there any advice you could offer to homeowners as to what they can do to try to minimize that? 
I, th I think one of the simplest things you can do is, is ventilate your house. Um, so, you know, we, we've got a, a great, we don't need fancy instruments for a lot of these pollutants. We've got a really good detector here. And I think mm. if you can smell things in your home uh, without going into too much detail, um, you should probably open a window. So, you know, there's, there are studies that have looked at um, when you cook, if after you cook, you have the window open for 10 minutes, you'll probably get rid of most of the pollutants that you've generated during that cooking or use your extractor fan. So we know that 75% of homes um, or 75% of home, home owners don't use their extractor fans when they cook. Um, so again, that's something very simple we could do to change behavior. Um, you could clean with windows open. Another thing you can do is clean early in the day when outdoor and hence indoor ozone concentrations are lower and you're likely to have fewer interactions between the cleaning chemicals and the ozone in the air. Um, another thing you can do is use um, liquid cleaners instead of spray cleaners. Mm. So if you think about what's happening with a spray cleaner, it's making you know it's a really effective way for the chemicals in your cleaner to get into your lungs it's very easy to breathe in aerosols it's much harder obviously to breathe in liquids so if you use liquid cleaners instead of spray cleaners that's that's another simple thing you could do I mean, some just to follow up to that though part of that being op opening you know the windows to the outdoors i mean it's predicated on the fact that you need to be in an environment where the outdoor air is better than the indoor air because i mean yeah. obviously there's some many places that that may not be the case right yep. the, outdoor, the outdoor environments could be worse yep so that's that's really tricky so probably the obvious example is where you live on a busy road hmm. but even then it's usually possible to open a window on the opposite side of the building um and if not you might have to go down the route of air cleaners but that that in itself can be controversial um so yeah that is tricky i mean ideally if we if we clear up our outdoor air quality, then that would be the obvious solution. Problems solved in many ways because then we do just open windows. So you 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 touched the third rail with uh, your mention of air cleaners. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a very um, shall I say very controversial area at this point. Um, what I mean, I've seen all different varieties of different tests that are out there. Uh, that people are talking about at this point. Do you do you have any thoughts on? I mean, there's a difference, obviously, from from air cleaners that use filters and air cleaners that use yeah. chemicals. Well, uh, yeah. sorbents, you could... sorbents too. That's I mean, they, you yeah. got to think in terms of those. And, and you yeah. know, and it is a loaded gun here because there's a lot of companies that make a lot of bizarre claims. You know, especially since yeah. the pandemic, there's just been a whole slew of products that hit market that probably shouldn't have. But yeah, agreed. So um, the US EPA have actually got a really good web page on this. Um, mm -hmm. But there are also others that have been looking at air cleaners. And I think everyone comes to more or less the same conclusion that probably the filtration devices are the, the best ones to use. Um, there's some work going on with UVC applications um, in some settings, but not all. Um, but I think the filtration devices for most homes would be the best bet if you absolutely need one. Um, so you're right that if you if you're using any chemicals to clean, there are going to be onward effects of the chemistry. So we, we've looked, we did a modeling study, well, measurement and modeling study of a cleaner. Um, so we, we basically borrowed this um, and the, company that lent it to us said that we could publish the results as long as we didn't say which company they were <laughs> um, and basically what this this cleaning machine was doing was um, mixing ozone and limonene in a chamber inside and then effectively it was making hydroxyl radicals and hydroxyl radicals are very strong oxidants um, so they were actually encouraging that chemical reaction because then the theory was that the hydroxyl radicals would um, basically kill any microorganisms in the room so it was meant to kill viruses this is this was before the days of covid and what we actually found was that um it wasn't particularly effective at killing the viruses but it also made oxidant levels that were probably a factor of 10 higher than outdoors on a sunny day mm. so 
you know, and then basically once this oxidant is in the room, it can start to break apart any volatiles there to, to start making your formaldehyde and making your particulate matter. So these chemical cleaners are not a good idea. And it's the same with the ones that work with plasmas or any other high energy sources. They are, they are going to um, make chemicals. It's inevitable when you think about how they're working. So the best ones to, to use are the HEPA filters. Um, and then you have to just make sure that you regularly change the filter and maintain the filter. Um, but yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah. gas phase uh, filter, you know, gas phase uh, absorbent type technology is still considered good too, right? I mean, carbon, potassium permanganate, that sort of thing, as far as. Um, yeah, I mean, I, now, I mean, I think it's hard to generalize with these things. See, so I don't know what's happening in the US, but in the UK, they're completely unregulated. Mm -hmm. And I think until we actually have a, um, I mean, and this this I know from working with some people who are trying to set up or to trying to develop, you know, good cleaners, it would benefit those sort of manufacturers as well. If there was somewhere that they could go and say, well, look, we've actually tested our cleaner in a realistic environment. So not in a controlled laboratory environment with, you know, very clean air, low humidity, controlled temperature. You need to put it in a house where you have steam and you have cooking emissions and you have cleaning going on, you need to test it under realistic conditions. Um, and you need to make sure that it's not making other pollutants. And I think until you set up that kind of regulatory environment, um, then it's it's hard to generalize about these cleaners. You need to be very careful, I think. Yeah, I mean, you, I think you hit the nail on the head with test chamber studies versus real world studies because mm -hmm. test chamber to you're getting recycling you know so so some of the efficacy that they claim with some of these air purifiers yes in a sealed environment they probably have a lot better kill rate against microbials and that sort of thing and removing stuff but in the real world do you really does that air truly cycle through that device you know that many yeah. changes per hour and yeah. And is it suitable for the size of space it's being used for? And and I, I was talking to someone that is looking at this in the UK, we're particularly concerned about schools because, mm. um, you know, quite often in, in UK schools anyway, that, you know, if there is a group of kids, a smaller group of kids, they might need to be taken off for extra support with lessons. They might be taken to quite a small room. And if you start putting in something that's making formaldehyde, you know, you, you just you just worry about whether these things, you know, are being used safely because it's and, and the other thing is that some of them are so noisy mm -hmm. that you end yep. up having to turn them down so that they don't make a noise to disturb you, particularly if you're teaching. So they're not actually running it any particular um, way that they're going to do any good anyway. So. I, I think it's a bit of a minefield around them, mm -hmm. to be honest. Well, even the activated carbon. I mean, there's different, yeah. you know, so many different incarnations of that. You know, if you just have a slightly activated carbon impregnated poly filter where there's just a little bit of material on it, you know, versus an actual sorbent bed of, you know, five, 10 pounds of activated carbon in a device, it's totally different levels of the ability to adsorb things. So, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Nick, you, you served on a, a committee. Um, the Sage Environmental Modeling Group, and, we, and that was a report on impacts of air cleaners and indoor air chemistry related to the COVID uh, pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit more about that particular project? Yeah, I mean, that's very related to what we've just been talking about, really. So in the early days of the pandemic here, I think people were looking for uh, quick solutions. And as we've been saying, you know, there were lots of people manufacturing um, air cleaning devices and um, claiming that they were 100% efficient at getting rid of COVID. So the SAGE group advised government on all, you know, emergency issues. Um, so the EMG part was the environmental modelling group. So they were tasked with looking at air cleaners and and coming up with some advice for, for the UK government. Um, so I was just involved with um, looking at some of the potential chemical pollutants that were formed when you use these things so pretty much as we've been saying I mean mm -hmm. some we had some crazy ideas early on in the pandemic so one of the things that was being muted was things like disinfectant spraying booths mm -hmm. um, so the idea was that you could open up cinemas and, and um, theatres again if everybody walked through this booth and got sprayed with the disinfectant, disinfectant which just shows how little people 
you know, just not thinking about the fact that you're breathing out a virus. Um, so if you spray someone, apart from the fact you spraying someone with disinfectant, mad idea anyway, but, you know, it wouldn't even do any good even if you did it because the minute someone breathed, the virus would be there again. So, um, so it's really to try and um, just, you know, officially say that a lot of these ideas were, were very silly. And, well, that and, same logic uh, of going in and spraying, you know, going and spraying in an office environment. Yeah. All, all the chemicals that were sprayed around the indoor environment, you know, just I think to, to have theatrical hygiene, right, and have have a show that you're yes. doing something, but yeah. you know, that's not the vector. <laughs> no, absolutely. So there, there would have been a lot of time and effort um, on hygiene theatre. That's a good description of it, actually. And 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 then you start to think about well, actually anyone going into that space afterwards is going to be exposed to all the secondary pollutants from the cleaning. So, right. yeah, completely. Not crazy. a good idea. <laughs> no, so, not at all. Is that book or that publication, is that available? If somebody wanted to download it is, that? It is available. I can, I can send you the link afterwards. Um, That'd be good. Yeah. Cause yeah. We, we, we still have a lot of discussions going on regards to air cleaners and related to the COVID pandemic and what, what to do with all these ones that they've now bought. I mean, there's school districts that have bought tens of thousands of these units and uh, you know, they, what are they, are they any good? Are they of, of any use? So if you, if, yeah, if you could po po get a post up on the, uh, on the, on the uh, comments, I think that would be helpful for people to be able to download yeah. that. So great. Um, so you had mentioned, um, uh, this part, um, publication from uh, Zhang and Alp in 2020, a paper where they examined the impact of using no-touch devices to clean hospitals. What did you find out in that particular study? Yeah, so that, again, this is all nicely related. Um, so what we were looking at in that study, uh, and this is with colleagues in um, Canada as well, so Tara Kahan and her group, um, we were looking at a, a, a kind of trend for using these so-called no-touch devices, which are basically um, machines that you wheel into rooms, so hospital wards being one example, um, and you basically fill that room with um, tens, hundreds, thousands of parts per million of disinfectant gases. So these are very, very mm. high concentrations of things like ozone, formaldehyde, um, hydrogen peroxide, you leave it in the room for an hour or two and then you flush it out. And the idea is that it's meant to kill things on surfaces, so kill microorganisms. Um, now, the way that people were deciding it was safe to go back into the room was by monitoring the disinfectant gas and deciding that once that had come down to a certain concentration, it was then safe to go back into the room. So I should have said, obviously, they only did this when people weren't in the rooms. Right. Um, so what we were looking at in the paper was, well, actually, what about the secondary chemistry? So the disinfectant gas might have disappeared, but what was going on behind the scenes that they weren't looking for? And, and we were finding that it was possible to have quite sustained um, periods of time after the disinfectant gas had got down to safe levels where we had high concentrations of some of the secondaries. And what was quite interesting as well was we looked at that for different light levels so people don't really think about the impact of light indoors so outdoors atmospheric scientists think very much about sunlight and how that can split bonds apart in molecules and then those new products can go on and do lots of stuff um, and nobody really thought about that being as important indoors well it's not as important but it can still be important so what we were looking at was the um, how the, the concentrations of these things change with different lighting. So we, we found, for instance, if you had something like a, a bare fluorescent lamp, which isn't completely um, unheard of in a hospital, that you could then actually initiate quite a lot of the uh, reactions that you, you might have outdoors in sunlight. So... So really what we found was a lot more chemistry going on under these conditions than we, we were expecting. And a recommendation from that work is that if you're going to use these things, then best to use them in the dark so you don't get additional chemistry going on. That, so that's actually fascinating. I, I think it's also interesting, you know, that you mentioned if they're monitoring the actual primary gas that's being used in, you know, in the, the mitigation process, but not the secondary uh, compounds you're creating, that's like totally short-sighted. 
but I think it's just because people don't think about the chemistry going on. So that so the you know the the idea of using those things is to kill microorganisms, which obviously mm -hmm. in a hospital is super important. Sure, because you yeah. want to make sure that you know people are safe when they when they're ill. Um, so if you're not looking for something, you don't tend to find it, do you? No, <laughs> and that's that's one of the problems is that uh, yeah. we, we, we the unintended consequences of doing some of these uh, activities is different, um, you know, from, from you know from very from location to location. I find that interesting that you were talking about the uh, light lighting, and you mentioned that the fluorescent lighting can can trigger some of this. Um, uh, how does that work? How, how do how do how do you know that something like that is taking place, and what do you do to try to mitigate it? So uh, we know that because of the work done by Tara Kahan, um, who's at the University of Saskatchewan. So her group has spent a lot of time looking at um, what, you know, how much light is coming from different indoor light sources. So she's looked at different lights, different types of fluorescent bulbs, halogen bulbs, um, LEDs, incandescent bulbs. So you can actually measure the, the photons effectively that are coming from those different light sources. And then you can compare that to sunlight outdoors. And that means that you can work out how quickly molecules will break apart in the presence of those different light sources. So for some lights, like the bare fluorescent lights, they have a significant component of UV light. Mm -hmm. um, so they can transmit quite a long way down towards the ultraviolet part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which means that you can start to split apart molecules indoors you wouldn't be able to um, under normal conditions. So, I mean, this is one interesting thing, I think, is that if, if we all switch to LED technology, so we are moving towards LED technology a lot in the UK, I'm not sure about the US, but here we are. And we know that LED lights have uh, transmit much well, they don't actually transmit much light below 400 nanometers and 400 nanometers means uh, if you cut off the light there it means that you won't get a lot of these high energy processes happening so just by changing the lights in your house actually you might stop some indoor chemistry happening which is quite interesting i think yeah definitely i mean uh, there is a move afoot to in both Canada and the United States to do more LED as opposed to the, you know, the, the common everyday light bulb. Uh, mm -hmm. So people would be interested in finding out more about that paper as well, quite frankly. So if you, if you can post that, that would be helpful yep. um, in that, that regard. And um, one of the things that you mentioned uh, in your CV is you were talking about the new Ingenious project that you're working on. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah. So that, that's really exciting actually. So this is, the biggest project that I've been involved with to date, I guess. And what we're doing in that is we are taking the, th the three most important components of studying indoor air quality, I think. We're going to be measuring indoor air pollutants. That's one aspect. We're going to be looking at human behavior. So that's the second aspect. And the third one is we're going to be looking at health impacts. So what we have access to through some of my colleagues on the grant um, is a health cohort called the Born in Bradford cohort. And these are people who live in the city of Bradford in the UK, which isn't far from York. And they have basically been recruited into this big health study um, starting back in 2010, I think the first people were recruited. And what they did was they recruited pregnant mothers at that time. And ever since, they have followed the health of the pregnant mothers and their children as they were born. Um, so we've got a lot of information about this cohort of people. We know about their asthma rates. We know about the number of visits to doctors. You know, we know a lot about this health cohort. So we know also that because of um, Bradford is one of the more deprived areas in the UK, there's a lot of social deprivation within this cohort. There's also a high level of ethnic minorities in this cohort. So these are a group of people that seldom have their voices heard. So we are quite interested in studying their homes. So we are going to take 300 um, families from the cohort over the course of a year. And then we'll be going into their homes um, for two week periods of time. Um, and we'll be basically measuring the indoor air pollution in their homes we will be asking them to keep behavioural behavioral diaries. 
um and then also we will be able to link to the to to the um health effects for a particular family so we will be able to bring these three together and i i really feel that that the nexus between those three things is where we really need to focus if we want to get policy right because it's like i was saying earlier about the cooker hoods that you know nearly all homes have got cooker hoods but most of them don't use them so why is that so you need to understand the behavioural aspect as well if you really want to solve this, if you really want to get on top of it. You need to understand why people do what they do, what they do in their homes, what the impacts are and how we, you know, how we help to make their health better. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that, though, as far as the exhaust, the exhaust hoods uh, for, you know, in residences in the United States. They're common, but ones that actually vent outdoors are not that common. I, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's a ton that are recirculate. All they are is fans with a metal screen. So yeah. they, all they do is recirculate air. And yeah. uh, even the ones that, that are venting, you know, I know the, the University of, uh, uh, I think Berkeley did a study years, uh, Lawrence Berkeley did a study on that, showing how ineffective a lot of those hoods were. Yeah. Because you know, they only, just, just the way they're designed, they're only partially over the burners and they really only catch, even when they're properly vented to the outdoors, they don't really, their efficacy isn't really that, as good as you might expect. No. No, they vary. They vary a lot. So, the, you know, there's another bit of advice, which is that you can, if you just use the back rings of your hob, then they're much more sure. effective for the, for the back burners. But yeah. Yeah. So, so well, I'm, I'm really excited about this project and I think it will really help us to, to understand, you know, what, not, not just the indoor air pollutants. So you, you can go and make measurements in lots of homes, but it's understanding what's causing the high concentrations. And, and the other aspect of the study is that with, a group of them we're going to go back and do some interventions so once we get our preliminary results we're hoping that we'll see patterns emerge that give us an indication as, as to why some of those homes have higher concentrations than others um which will help us to design some interventions and we're working with some really interesting people on the intervention side of things so we've got people that have come up with various apps that might be useful we'll be trying things like visual aids uh, uh maybe different types of cleaning devices so it'll be really interesting to look at um you know if we can come up with a way to try and like i say improve the air quality in these homes so how long is this project uh, designed to <clears throat> continue on what, what length of time are you going to be looking at these homes so it's a four-year project but oh, yeah. we're going to spend a year in the homes uh, initially measuring uh, the concentrations and then we'll go back and do a intervention um, study as well at, at a later part of the project. So, I mean, what what uh, indoor air chemistry uh, are you looking at? What 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 are you measuring? So we're going to be measuring. So we, because it's it's a big study, obviously, and the mm -hmm. bigger the study, the more expensive it gets. So in each of the homes, we're going to deploy a uh, cheap sensor kit. So mm -hmm. relatively low cost, but the accuracy maybe not perfect but it will give us an indication so we'll be measuring things like pm um some of the nitrogen oxides carbon dioxide humidity and temperature so every home we will measure that in about half of them we'll additionally measure uh volatile organic compounds and the way we're going to do that is by just taking a canister sample so we just collect some air from the home take it back to york and analyze it there where we've got lots of um equipment that you wouldn't want to put in someone's home basically and then in about 100 of the homes, we're going to do additional particle measurements. These involve collecting filter samples. So it's a pump and it's quite noisy, which is why we can't really do it in all of the homes. And then in a subset of those in 50 homes, we're going to do some even more detailed particle measurements. So we, we have like a pyramid structure. So mm -hmm. so at the bottom, we've got the, the cheaper measurements Um that we'll have in every home and then in a subsection we'll have the more detailed more expensive more challenging noisy measurements and we're hoping to kind of develop proxies between the cheap sensors and the more detailed more expensive measurements so we can try and you know join the dots where we don't have those measurements um because in the future you could imagine that many homes could have a a sensor pack if we knew what it was telling us um mm -hmm. so that that's a challenge really well, that seems like it would be quite valuable 
to be able to do, you know, use more precise analytical, you know, technology that you're going to do on, on the limited uh, subset, subset of those uh, studied homes and be able to at least compare that against the generalized data from the less expensive sensors. And yeah. it, at least that, that's actually really good because there hasn't been enough of that done to, to you know, to use more uh, quantifiable, you know, standard uh, protocols that actually are, are validated. You know, ver yeah. versus some cheap sensor technology, and, and not nothing against cheap sensor technology. Just making it readily available, at least if it's somewhat replicatable, is still good. It doesn't have to be yeah. that precise. It's still giving you yeah. a range because those those are data logging, correct? So that, yeah, it's, I think it's they're ongoing. Yeah, working out what they're telling you. So they might not be giving you the exact number, but if you can work out what the indication means, then it might still be useful. It shows trends, at least. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Are you looking at, uh, say, the ventilation systems, if they have any, or what, what, you know, do they rely on windows, do they have some kind of HVAC uh, system, what, what are you looking really, at? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just windows, we don't really do HVAC in the UK, mm -hmm. apart from big public buildings, maybe, um, so most, very few homes will have HVAC in the UK, so Yeah, so that's what, so you'll be looking at behavior then because you're looking at basically whether they open the windows when they when they should be opening them and, and looking at what what might be the effect on their health if they uh, if they don't do this you know it's yeah you said mitigation or inter intervention yeah interesting study so when does that start so it started last august and it's a four-year okay. study so it's still got another three and a third three and a quarter years something like that yeah yeah, that, that's going to take. And, and your role as modeler, what what are your what 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 does your group do in so, terms of that? So I, I guess I'm the over, overall project manager, um, okay. but my particular scientific input will be around the modeling. Yes, so that will be what we're looking at. Yeah, and trying to understand, you know, um, what, what's going on that we can't measure as well that would be the other thing and, and the other thing that we're going to be doing with the models is thinking about the future because we know that air quality is changing outdoors so we're expecting more of the kind of lockdown stuff going on outdoors vehicle technology is improving significantly at least in places like the uk and the us so outdoor air pollution is getting better on the whole um that has ramifications for indoor air quality so what are they? And that's where you can really start to bring the models in and think about, well, actually, if outdoor ozone does in, in, increase, what does that mean for indoor air chemistry? And what's the next thing we need to think about? So just one last question. I was wondering if you have any specific projects or, or other uh, items that you're working on right now that you can tell us about? Oh, I think I've, I've probably gone through most of them. I mean, the, the only other one maybe to give a shout out to is um, another Sloan project we haven't talked about, which is called Mocky. And that's looking at uh, a modeling consortium, basically, for indoor environments. And what we're trying to do there is combine a whole range of models from the molecular scale. I'm thinking about how, for instance, molecules in skin move around and how mm -hmm. that can be affected by um, air pollution, all the way up to kind of uh, CFD, so um, computer fluid, um, brain's gone dead, CFD models. Um, so looking at movements of air on a large scale. So we, we're going from that molecular scale up to room scale um, movements and everything in between. And what we're doing with this range of models, I think we've got seven models, um, is trying to look at ways we can get them to talk to each other better at all these different spatial scales and um, temporal scales and what we what we can learn from that. So that's also an interesting project. Yeah, definitely. Fascinating. Really appreciate uh, you spending an hour with us uh, talking about uh, the various projects you're involved with. And uh, thank you very much. And Bob, if you want to wrap it up. Yeah, that, that was great. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you today. There's some really uh informative uh conversation um so it's just just a reminder the show uh the, the recordings of this show the uh both the uh, video uh, uh recording as well as the audio podcast are available or will be available at global.healthyindoors.com indefinitely under the indoor environment show tab there's uh, on the left it's like a social media platform so you can get to it there and also wanted to remind everyone that uh this broadcast is a uh, joint uh production of the indoor society of indoor air excuse me, International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, ISIAC, and the Indoor Environmentally 
uh, in her environmental quality global lines of killing it Don. it's just one of those <laughs> days you know it's it's right in front of me too i should be able to read it but you know I, i'll i'll make the excuse that it's the beginning of season two and i'm allowed to make a couple of mistakes anyway so thank of you course. so very much this was great uh we're back again next month right don well we... yes we'll be back in may uh we'll have someone from the IEQGA side of the fence we've not yet been decided but we'll be looking forward to holding it sometime in may so again, thank you, Nicola. We really appreciate your time. And uh, you know, maybe we'll catch up at some conference somewhere down the line. That'd be great. Great, thank you.